the international monetary system that now prevails around the world did not drop out of the sky. <laughs> it didn't come from Baghdad, it didn't come from Mombasa, where did it come from? Before we examine that international monetary system, let's find out who is the author, who are the architects. And for that I have, with your permission, to take you to the Quran, to Surah Al-Ma'ida of the Quran, to answer the question, who is the architect? of the modern international monetary system. Who is the architect of the modern international political system with the United Nations? And before that the League of Nations. Who are those who have given this to the world? بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعضهم أولياء بعض وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُ مِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Surah Al-Ma'ilah If we use the wrong methodology, if you'll excuse me, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. We have Christians here who are doing the recording for me. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. They are friends and allies of each other. That doesn't sound true to me at all. I don't know about you. Jews and Christians were never friends and allies of each other. The Christians accuse the Jews of having committed the ultimate crime of killing God himself. Can't do worse than that. And so there was always enmity and hostility between Christians and Jews. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. They are friends and allies of each other. And whosoever from amongst you turn to them, friendship and alliance belong to them. And Allah does not provide guidance for a people who commit zulm. That's the wrong methodology. Now let us go to the rest of the Quran, where Allah permits, Allah permits a Muslim man to marry a Christian woman, uh, except of course in Malaysia. Allah permits a Muslim man to marry a Christian woman. So after you marry her, with this wrong methodology, you're going to have to say to her, Sweetheart, you can only be my wife, you can't be my friend. <laughs> That's where you land with wrong methodology. You can't have an alliance with any Christians or any Jews. Well then what was the Mithak of Medina? Was that not an agreement, a contract, a treaty which including Muslims and Jews and pagan Arabs contracted by the Prophet himself alayhi salatu wasalam. We are heading into troubled waters now. And then in the Quran Allah tells us أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى And you certainly find those who have the most love for you to be those who say we are Christians. And you're going to say to them, we can't be friends. We can't have an alliance with you. Sounds as though we're getting into even more troubled waters now with this defective translation of the verse. Well then what is the meaning of the verse? It is when you go to the totality of the data in the Quran which we cannot do in this short address. 
that we realize that no, 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 this is not what the verse is saying. Do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies. Not all Jews. No! A Jew who is opposing the state of Israel, opposing its oppression, who is supporting the Palestinians in this struggle for liberation from oppression. Why in the name of all the heavens above, why can't he be your friend? Where has reason gone? Why can't we live as friends and neighbors with Christians and with Jews who are not hostile to Islam? Why? Do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who ba'aduhum awliya ubad, who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is anticipating an event which is to occur. When a strange and mysterious reconciliation will take place between some Christians and some Jews and a Jewish friendship, Jewish Christian or Judeo-Christian friendship and alliance will emerge. The Quran is anticipating that event. And the Quran is saying to us, do not, do not be friends and allies of that Judeo-Christian alliance. But you would never have got this being unless you had used the proper methodology. And whosoever turns to them, that Judeo-Christian alliance, which it is very easy to recognize has already emerged and it is bonded by Zionism. Whoever turns to them to be their friends and allies like Husni Mubarak, is that his name? Seems to have forgotten his name now. Like Parvez Musharraf, is that his name? Seems to have forgotten his name now. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance, فَإِنَّهُ minhum. He belongs to them. He's no longer part of us. So we, knew we need a new theology. We need a new theology for Akhirul Zaman. In Allah la yahdi al qawm al Allah will not provide guidance for a people who have this as their trademark. Zulum. So the Judeo-Christian alliance would have as its trademark that it commits zulum after zulum after zulum. That Judeo-Christian alliance is responsible for giving to the world modern Western civilization. Modern Western civilization did not drop out of the sky. It has not emerged in history by accident. No. There is an architect. And this is the architect. That Judeo-Christian alliance has given to the world the modern scientific and technological revolution. They are at the heart of it. That Judeo-Christian alliance, the Zionist alliance, has given to the world the international monetary system that we now have. It didn't drop out of the sky. And the Quran has forbidden us from being a part of that international monetary system which has come from them. 
and the Quran has enforced uh, informed us if we join them we become a part of them we belong to them having answered that question from whence has the international monetary system emerged now let us proceed to describe it does money have integrity huh? are, we bring, are we going to bring the department of moral philosophy now into the department of monetary economics <coughs> When you ask the monetary economist the question, he runs for cover. He says, they didn't teach me that at university. Does money have integrity? Is there such a thing as true money and false money? Is there such a thing as money with integrity and money which is bogus and fraudulent? Is there such a thing as, excuse the language, I don't know whether you're, you're familiar with the term, is there such a thing as Sharia compliant money? <laughs> you never heard that one before, huh? Is there such, you know the bastion of Sharia compliance? They're parading the streets now. Anywhere you turn, Sharia compliant. So, excuse me, sir. Can I have a word with you? We're very busy. We've got a lot of work to do. I only want one minute, sir. Is there such a thing as money which is Sharia compliant? They turn around and they run away. They're no different from the monetary economist, which is PhD from Harvard. They turn around and they run away. Yes, of course. Money must have integrity. Yes, of course. There's halal money and there's haram money. Yes, of course. And when we turn to the international monetary system, which emerged for purposes of making the lecture short from Bretton Woods, the conference which took place in upstate New York, at the end of that conference there emerged an agreement. It is puzzling to me that no one as yet has made a critical study of the Bretton Woods Accord from the perspective of the Sharia. It is puzzling and baffling to me that no one as yet has made a study of the Charter of the United Nations Organization from the perspective of the Sharia. It is, buzz it is puzzling and baffling to me that no one as yet has made a critical study of the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund from the perspective of the Shia, Sharia. Perhaps we can urge some bright PhD student to take up these subjects. Hmm? At Bretton Woods they came to a beautiful agreement. A beautiful agreement that well, actually, they didn't tell it, us, tell it to us until the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund came into being shortly after that. That we will not allow gold to be used as money. Well, that's strange. That's baffling. Because Allah has provided for us something called a dinar. I don't know if you ever heard about it. And it's in the Quran. I don't know if you know about that. Oh, you do, eh? That's too bad for you. وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ إِنْتَأْمَنْهُ بِكِنْتَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ so, dinar is in the Quran. 
And the dinar in the Quran is not made of paper. It's a gold coin. And dirham is in the Quran. And the dirham in the Quran is not made of paper. It's a silver coin. And yet, the International Monetary Fund, the Articles of Agreement, prohibits the use of this money. How come it did not register on all the scholars of Islam who are experts in Islamic finance? Hmm? That Allah has given something as money is there in the Quran. And they, the Judeo-Christian alliance bonded by Zionism, who gave us the International Monetary Fund, they have prohibited its use as money. Ron Paul, the presidential candidate, the perennial presidential candidate in US elections, has been advocating the cause of the gold coin for some time now. So Ron Paul penned a letter to the US Treasury Department many years ago asking the Treasury Department for an explanation. Why has the United States of America entered into that agreement with the International Monetary Fund accepting the prohibition of gold as money? Ron Paul wants to know why. A few years have passed and he's still waiting for an answer. They will not answer him. The, the Bretton Woods Agreement substituted real money with paper currencies. And chose one currency, the US dollar, to function as the international currency. It caused Charles de Gaulle indigestion. He didn't like it at all, Charles de Gaulle. It's unfair to me. We're France. Vive la France. <laughs> Why should Uncle Sam have this, <laughs> this unfair advantage? That only the US dollar would be redeemable in gold at the rate of $35 an ounce of gold. And remember, when we, the Judeo-Christian Alliance, when we give our word, we don't have to keep our word. Pacta sunt servanda is for the birds, not for us. Pacta sunt servanda, the Latin term for treaties and agreements must be honored. It's at the heart of international relations. Pacta sunt servanda. So the US dollar would be redeemable at $35 an ounce of gold, but when we give our word, we don't have to keep it. And all the rest of the paper currencies in the world would not be redeemable in gold. But rather they would have their value in relation to the US dollar. Giving to the US dollar a commanding position in the world of money as the international currency par excellence. So the United States can become without any question of a doubt the ruling state in the world. And to compound that the United States entered into an agreement with OPEC, the oil exporting countries. An agreement which was haram because it violated the free and the fair market. That none of them will sell oil to anyone other than with payment in US dollars. <laughs> you can bring as much gold in the world, you cannot buy oil with gold. You cannot buy oil with German marks. You cannot buy it with Australian dollars. You can't buy it with any... Forget about the ringgit. The only way you can buy oil is with US dollars. And so an entrenched, an entrenched system 
that destroys the free and fair market. And so all those currencies out there now are not redeemable in gold. It's like writing a check which cannot be cashed. You can only exchange the check for another check. You can never cash the check. That's haram. So that system is 99% haram. And then Bretton Woods went on to give a second blow to the free and fair market. And that's all that Islam has ever given. A free and a fair market which does not which does not give any advantage to the Muslim over the non-Muslim. So there is no Bhumiputra policy in Islam. No. You plant, you reap. You don't plant, you will not reap. A kafir can come in the market. Someone worshipping the idols can come in the market and have equal status with a Muslim in our market because it's a free and a fair market. But now the international monetary system, the international monetary fund out of Bretton Woods declares that the US dollar is redeemable in gold at $35 an ounce but only governments can redeem. People cannot. Oh, so is it only is it only governments who buy roti chennai? What about us? We buy roti chennai as well. We also take some time to buy tetarek. So only governments can redeem. So the system is ninety nine point nine percent haram. Only point one percent the fig leaf is there for those who have eyes and yet cannot see. And even that one percent disappeared when Charles de Gaulle knocked on the door of Richard Nixon one Sunday morning perhaps. No, maybe Saturday morning. Hi there. Are you there? Bonjour. <laughs> so Richard Nixon woke up, opened the door, <laughs> so Charles de Gaulle. <laughs> I have three billion US dollars. Come on Uncle Sam, I want the gold. Charles de Gaulle was not expecting what the Americans would do. So they retired, you know, they always do that, retired to Camp David. And then Sunday morning, they announced, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it. And so they took Bretton Woods and they tore it up. In other words, they refused to redeem the three billion dollars in gold. Why? Because if they gave that three billion in gold to Charles de Gaulle, there would be a line. By Monday morning, nine o'clock, there'd be a line outside. And first in the line would be Saudi Arabia. And then there would be Kuwait. And you know, Uncle Sam, we want the gold. But they had printed more paper than they had gold. If I did that, they'd throw me in Guantanamo. <laughs> and so the monetary system, which dropped out, no, not from the sky, sorry, from the Anglo-American, the Judeo-Christian Alliance, Zionist Judeo-Christian Alliance, was bogus, was fraudulent, was haram. This was September 1971 when the 0.1% disappeared. And since September 1971 it is now, you can say it once you know the subject. You can take a piece of paper and print a picture on it and put a number on it and say abracadabra and you can assign to that piece of paper an entirely fictitious value. Oh? So one piece of paper would have the value of roti chanai. And another piece of paper would have the value of a BMW. 
And if you have a printing press and you have enough paper and ink, you can buy all the oil of Saudi Arabia. And when they print their paper, on, on the other hand, when they pin, print their paper, and they put a whole suitcase filled of their paper, a Bangladeshi taka, and you go to downtown, midtown Manhattan, you can't even buy a cup of coffee with it. You can't even buy a cup of coffee with it. And yet we accepted it. Even though Allah prohibited us. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ لَا تَتَّخِذُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَةِ In other words, the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam displayed the intellectual acumen of donkeys. This is harsh language. But I believe it's too late now. Even the harsh language is too late because the job is already done. They don't need it anymore. That international monetary system is collapsing. It's collapsing. I anticipate it would not be long from now before the United States government demonetizes the US dollar. When last, about, when last I heard about the US dollar, it was in some hospital. <laughs> Terminally ill. Terminally ill. And they know it cannot recover. Yeah. So they're going to demonetize the US dollar. But what do they have to replace it with? In fact, the replacement is already here. I used to be saying 15 years ago, and uh, Mustafa would bear witness to this, that the US dollar is going to collapse. And when it collapses, you're going to bring down the whole world of paper money with it. Hmm? And, then, and then a new monetary system will emerge. Of course I was wrong. A new monetary system will emerge, which will be money that you can't see, money that you can't touch. Who but those who have the intellectual acumen of donkeys will accept money you can't see, and money you can't touch. Huh? But they will throw dust in your eyes and they'll, welcome, they'll say to you, welcome to the cashless world. Welcome to the world of electronic money. Welcome to the world of digital money. Hmm? In fact, that electronic money is already here. In fact, that electronic money has already taken control of the majority of transactions of involving big money. And the paper currency is used for only microtransactions. They will need to have something to replace the US dollar and the world of paper money. Whatever it is, they know what they have, but it will be used for microtransactions. I think it's going to be a little cumbersome to use your debit card to buy roti chanai. Hmm? So you need some kind of tangible money for microtransactions. Hmm. Well then where are they going? From Bretton Woods, which has now collapsed, to a monetary system of electronic money where you don't need any printing press anymore. You don't need paper, you don't need ink. All you need is to type in and type out. It is a magnificent system of financial espionage. Magnificently designed. I have to give credit where credit is due. Satan is sometimes brilliant. So they know how much money you have. 
they know how you're using your money and they can whenever it's convenient to them shut down your account and when they shut down your account don't come to me no 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 don't come to me and complain because the Quran tells us what is money but where are they going with this financial Guantanamo called electronic money I want to now suggest to you that I could not have had this insight into monetary economics in which I began with the sterling pound to the US dollar and so on without a branch of knowledge called Islamic eschatology or the ilm of akhir zaman that I could not have penetrated the world of money without studying the subject of Dajjal the false messiah and without studying Gog and Magog I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran which is there 10 years ago Jerusalem in the Quran probably qualifies as a textbook of Islamic eschatology Jerusalem in the Quran has been translated to several languages including Malay it has become a bestseller it has remained a bestseller for 10 years it has been accepted by thousands who are convinced by the analysis and yet I have failed I have failed again and again and again and again and I have failed miserably in convincing the world of Islamic scholarship <coughs> I have failed miserably in convincing the ulama the shuyukh the muftis and I do not want to show disrespect for the scholars of Islam so I have been forced to move on on my own and so from Jerusalem in the Quran we now have several other books which has emerged hmm? I'm still working on the book on Dajjal it is because of Islamic eschatology that I was able to recognize it must have been about less than a year ago I realized that Israel will have to bring back gold and silver as money I realize that and since I already knew from Jerusalem in the Quran that Israel is going to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world that when Israel re restores gold and silver as money it means that the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance is going to bring back gold and silver as money why? Why? Only Islamic eschatology can answer that question. They don't teach this in the Department of Economics or Monetary Economics. The Jal was created by Allah and programmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to impersonate the true Messiah so he has to rule the world from Jerusalem all the evidence is there in that book and then he has to stand up in Jerusalem and declare I am the Messiah al Masih. but he would not be the Messiah he would be the false Messiah when he makes his declaration that I am the Messiah he can then rub his hands and say mission accomplished it is only then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send back the true Messiah the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam is the heart of Islamic eschatology and I thank Allah that it is not stated in the Quran explicitly thank you Allah so you got to do your homework 
You've got to string the verses together as a necklace. You've got to locate the system of meaning before you can penetrate the subject. It won't come easily. In order for Dajjal to successfully complete his mission of impersonation and convince the Jews that he is the Messiah, he's got to bring back gold and silver as money. Oh yes. I was engaged in a Judeo-Muslim Christian dialogue at Drew University in New Jersey in the United States many years ago. And I was the only spokesman for Islam. And there must have been a dozen rabbis out there. And I don't know, two, three dozen Christian ministers out there. I was out man and out gunned. And I made the mistake. And as soon as I made the mistake, they jumped on me. They were so happy to correct me. And I'm glad that they corrected me. I said that when Jesus entered the temple, he found them engaged in riba. And he cursed them. And he overturned their tables. And he chased them out of the temple. And he said, you've taken the house of God and transformed it into a den of thieves. And the riba was lending money on interest. Oh my gosh, they jumped on me. He said, Imran, let us explain to you because you don't know. The temple had to mint its own coins, Imran. Because the Roman money had graven images on it. And that was not kosher. Kosher, halal. And so when the people brought the animals to the temple for Zabiha, you know you're not allowed to do it yourself, huh? Only a rabbi could do it. You want to eat some mutton? The rabbi has to do the sabiha. You've got to pay the rabbi. They could not pay with Roman money because that was haram because of the graven image. So they had to change Roman money to temple money. And the money changers were ripping them off. That is the explanation, Imran. So I sat down and I bowed my head and I accepted the correction. But thank you for having corrected me. Because now I know why Dajjal will have to mint gold and silver. Because in order for him to convince the Jews that he is the Messiah. He has to bring back that money which the temple and the Jews considered to be kosher. And that is gold coins and silver coins without any graven image. Two weeks ago, or was it three weeks ago? The state of Utah in the United States. The uh, House of Representatives perhaps it's called. Enacted legislation legalizing the use of gold and silver coins in Utah as legal tender while the muftis of Islam were drinking tetaric <laughs> that is the nicest language I can use because I don't want to offend anyone Allah will deal with his servants as he chooses to deal with his servants all that remains now is for the governor to sign the legislation. And gold and silver will become legal tender in Utah. When that happens, and I'm sure it will happen, because if the governor does not sign it, they will ship him out faster than Federal Express. <laughs> oh yes. That is Utah. <laughs> There will be other states in the United States 
which will want to follow. So Barack Obama will have to respond, and I'm waiting to see his response. The Federal Reserve will have to respond, the Treasury Department will have to respond, and the International Monetary Fund will have to respond. And so I'm waiting to see their response. But I'm suggesting to you that this could be the beginning of what eventually will transpire as the return of gold and silver as money in order that Israel may have credentials when it rules the world, when it replaces the United States of America as the next ruling state, may have credentials that the Jal can use when he claims to be the Messiah. What should we do now? Islam and the international monetary system. When you have abandoned the Quran and the Sunnah, and you recognize that you have abandoned the Quran and Sunnah, then you must make Tawbah. You must turn around and you must return to the Quran and Sunnah. Return to gold and silver. Return to the dinar and the dirham. I don't have expertise on weights and measures. But I do know that when you have your market, and you have your dinar from Kalantan or your dinar from Dubai or wherever it is and a British merchant comes to your market and he brings a British gold coin you will have to accept his money in your market and when Utah comes to your market to buy durians and Utah wants to pay with their gold coins your market will have to accept them all your market will have to have an administrative unit that will be able to evaluate okay, weights and measures and purity. So I cannot for the life of me in understand the insistence of declaring only one particular weight and one particular measure and one particular purity as the dinar and all the rest are not dinars. I think that's a recipe for fitna. But again, this is not my area of expertise. Weights and measures and purity, I leave it for those in this university who have that expertise. How are they likely to respond if we are to introduce gold and silver coins in the market as money? I think Utah might get away with it, but they would not allow the world of Islam to do it because they want to keep us under their grip until the Dajjal has completed his mission. I can be wrong. If we cannot bring back the dinar and dirham in the central market, in KL, then what should we do? I've been saying this for 15 years now. If the macro is not possible, why not the micro? Hmm? Mao Zedong did it. Fidel Castro did it. Che Guevara was trying to do it. That you start from the periphery and you approach the center from the periphery. Hmm? So you go to the remote countryside and you build micro markets or you take existing markets and you transform them into free and fair markets with money which is halal the dinar and dirham and as, uh, what was his name the Turkish scholar um, Said Nursi Said Nursi Badil Zaman Said Nursi he had this idea as well of fanning out into the countryside and preserving the deen in the countryside. And that's how Islam survived in Turkey. And now it is the countryside that is giving the generals headache. The countryside which is moving back on the cities. And the countryside which tomorrow will liberate Istanbul. So that the Russian navy would have access to the Mediterranean. That's going to go 
cause headaches for Israel and for NATO when the Russian Navy has access to the Mediterranean and the Russian Navy has nuclear armed ships and submarines. It is, the, it is the Turkish countryside that's doing that. So we move to the countryside. And this is what Surah Al-Kahf tells us to do. Allah will shower you with his mercy. If you try to restore Islam in the remote countryside at the micro level. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may increase our knowledge of the monetary system with which the world is now plagued, the bogus and fraudulent and haram monetary system, that Allah may accept our humble effort to try to extricate ourselves from this sorry mess, and that Allah may forgive us our sins. Rabbana taqabal minna innaka anta samiyul alim wa tawa alayna ya mawlana innaka anta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya ahmar rahmin. Ameen. If uh, you are a critical student, you will never accept anything that I say without first being convinced that it is the truth. If you do otherwise, I'll be terribly disappointed in you. <laughs> you must first be convinced of something as the truth before you accept it. And so don't listen to me alone. You have that Sharia council and you have that mufti and you have this one and study them all. And if at the end of the day you are convinced that the OIC is correct, well fine, accept the OIC. I am not going to comment on their opinions. I'm going to restrict myself and very sensibly so to presenting my own view and leave you to do your homework. But if you make a mistake on a matter involving shirk, remember what can be the consequences. Okay, in the Quran, Allah is described as Al Khaliq, the one who creates. In the Quran, Allah is described as Al-Fatir, the one who not only creates but originates. I think the Hindus call him Ishwar, the one who originates. But that's not all. In the Quran, Allah is described as Badiyus Samawati wal the one who creates Abnovo from nothing. <coughs> Only Allah creates wealth from nothing. Only Allah creates wealth from nothing. If you take a piece of paper, now that you have your PhD in Islamic finance, if you take a piece of paper, this is post September 71, and you print a picture and you put a number on it, and you assign to it an entirely fictitious value, you are attempting to create wealth from nothing. They have a pretty name for it. I don't know where they got it out from. Hollywood, perhaps. They call it fiat money. They probably got that name from Hollywood. You are creating or you are attempting to create wealth from nothing. And so long as Imran Hussein keeps on buying the US dollar, eh? and changing the US dollar wherever he travels. Imran Hussein is accepting our act of shirk. Because that is an act of shirk. To attempt to create wealth out of nothing. Itakhazu. Suratul Tawbah. Suratul Tawbah. Itakhazu. أَهْبَارَهُمْ وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَالْمَسِيحَ بْنَ مَرْيَمْ وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا يَعْبُدُوا إِلَهًا وَاحِدٌ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ سُبْحَانَهُ عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ 
they took their priests and rabbis as gods and lords beside Allah. And they did the same with the Messiah, the son of Mary. But they had not been ordered other than to worship one God. There is no God beside him. Glory be to him. Far removed is he from this act of shirk. Which shirk? Taking your priests and rabbis and your molanas and your muftis as God's laws beside Allah. <coughs> So man came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, but the Christians and the Jews do not worship their priests and rabbis as gods and laws. And the Muslims don't worship their Mawlanas as God and Lord. How can Allah say so? No Muslim accepts the Mufti as God. How could Allah say so? To which the Prophet responded and asked, did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is their shirk. And did the people not follow them in it? That is their shirk. So I am saying to you, and you do not have to accept my view. Not at all. I am saying to you, based on my knowledge of Islamic eschatology, this is the work of Dajjal, to take paper, and assign to it a fictitious value and attempt to create money. Well, this is an act of shirk. And when I use that money, I follow him into the shirk. This is not based on element of doubt in between halal and haram. My gosh, this machine Excuse me, this machine. You must remind me to turn it off. Huh? Now the punishment. The punishment. In Sahih Bukhari, and they don't teach Sahih Bukhari in the Department of International Monetary Economics. <laughs> there are four ahadith. which are very strange. It is the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Ar-Rahman, the compassionate, Ar-Rahim, the merciful, Al-Ghaffar, the forgiving. Allah who says, tell my servants if they come to me with sins as high as the clouds above the sky, I will forgive them all. This is how he is. He says to Adam alayhi salam, take out or separate the people for the hellfire. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for the hellfire. You don't have to believe me. Just open Sahih Bukhari and we'll read it. Four times, so mutawatir. How is it possible that the God who is merciful and forgiving, who says, tell my servants, if inna Allah yaghfiru zunuba jami'ah, Allah is prepared to forgive all sins. How is it possible for him to consign 999 out of every 1,000 to the hellfire? There's only one answer to that question. That there's one sin that he will not forgive. And that is shirk. Or in Malay you say shirk. And so the only possible explanation for this hadith is that 999 out of every 1000 are entering into the hellfire because, basically because of shirk. And I am doing nothing more than suggesting to you, you do not have to accept my opinion that we are inundated with shirk all around the world today. There is shirk in that monetary system. There is shirk in the political system of the modern secular state with its claims to democracy. When it declares that sovereignty is now located with the people, no longer with Allah. 
he is no longer al malik the sovereign forget the word king this is political terminology now this is political terminology he is sovereign but the modern secular state which came from the judeo-christian european alliance the zionist alliance that modern secular state which has embraced all of mankind that modern secular state says that sovereignty is now located in the state that is shirk you don't have to believe me follow mufti if you want that modern secular state says that supreme authority is no longer with Allah he's no longer al-akbar the state is now al-akbar the modern secular state did not drop out of the sky it didn't come from Hollywood when will you wake up you got to study Islamic eschatology to understand the emergence of modern Western civilization you've got to study Islamic eschatology to be able to understand the phenomenon of the modern political system and the modern economic system the modern secular state says that Allah is no longer al hakam he's no longer the supreme lawgiver supreme law is that of the state that is shirk the modern secular state says Allah can make it haram but we can make it halal and Surah to Tawbah tells us that is shirk and so my answer to you is that yes it is not located in the gray area between halal and haram it is most firmly located in the area of haram however if you are convinced by the fatwa of the OIC and the fatwa of this one and that one by all means you can follow them you don't have to listen to me any other questions